Thank you. It's a pleasure to be here. And I really admire that Steve, with this uh, conference, and Brian and Anne Marie, have thought to bring environment into the issue of human health and a holistic thinking in really a very, very bold and uh, extreme way, which is to say, let's look at the planet as well. A lot of people say that, but they may not understand the implications of that. And we are in a new era. The reason I picked sea level rise in particular is sea level rise proves climate change because we don't think about it, but the size of the ice on the planet, the ice sheets, changes over geologic time. It's been stable for a few thousand years, as I'm going to explain to you. But the height of the ocean, which reflects the amount of ice we have on the planet, is proof of long-term climate change. It's a different way of looking at it, but it's also one of the biggest impacts as sea level change is going to change where we live in real estate. So it gets very, very personal, but it's over a long time frame. So I try and help people see a big picture. And I walk, we're going to allow time for a few questions at the end because I always welcome that. My book came out two and a half years ago, and uh, it was the week of Hurricane Sandy, and it was a very terrible event, but very fortuitous timing because I actually described an event exactly like Sandy hitting Atlantic City in New York City the week before it happened. So I got on television and so on, and they said, Mr. Englander, how did you possibly predict this, you know, week before it happened, and I didn't predict it. I was describing one of many scenarios about what would inevitably happen. I had no idea it could happen with that kind of timing, but it made it very powerful. There's a lot of confusion about sea level rise. Um, most people think that the melting polar ice cap, we tend to associate with the polar bear habitat, and people are justifiably concerned about that. It's really somewhat irrelevant to sea level rise because as the ice melts in the Arctic, it doesn't affect sea level. And that surprises people, but it's a simple fact. It's like ice cubes in a glass. If you take a glass with iced tea or gin and tonic or whatever you like and look at the level of, of liquid, and if there's floating ice cubes in it and mark the level of the glass, it won't change as the ice melts, even though there's 10% above the surface, just like an iceberg. That ice is floating. The problem is different, and we're gonna to get to that in a minute. It's the glaciers on land and thermal expansion of seawater and some other things. But first, let's put things in a bigger perspective and get rid of other points of confusion. We tend to look at unusual storms, which are most likely associated with climate change, global warming. And uh, those manifest themselves like Sandy. There's other events, even no-name storms that are now flooding. This is a street in Fort Lauderdale, the beachfront uh, main road there. And it was underwater a month after Sandy during the no-name storm, the Thanksgiving storm of 2012. These are showing us what things will look like when sea level rises maybe 30, 40, 50 years from now. It's a revolutionary view. But there's some big differences. Sea level, is not, sea level rise is not like a storm surge. It helps us to visualize it, but the difference is sea level rise will be global and it's not going to recede for a thousand years or longer. So it's effectively permanent. And the impact zone is bigger. So this is revolutionary thinking. And just like we need to think differently about our bodies and our health and what we put into it and how we take care of ourselves, we need to think of the planet differently. And it's different than we thought of it 50 years ago in terms of what the threats are. We're at 7 billion people, we're headed to 10 billion, we've changed the atmosphere, the ice caps are melting, sea level's rising, we need a bigger view, and that's what I try and give people. Now, to give you a very down-to-earth residential example, there's coastal communities all over the world where they put in storm drains so that during extreme rainfall events that extra water would be diverted to some waterway or some other system. Well, every 28 days in this neighborhood in Broward County, but I could show you places from around the world, the water backs up. That's salt water. And when that community was created 50 years ago, that didn't happen. The sea level down there is about 14 inches higher than it was a century ago. And that's not a storm event. That's predictable by the tide cycle, by the alignment of the planets, the full moon. That's what determines an extreme high tide. 
It was a cover of National Geographic a year and a half ago, September 2013. And it made the point that when all the ice melts, how high sea level will be. I, I know some of them read my book, and it's interesting because the first sentence of my book says the same point, that when all the ice on the planet melts, sea level will be 212 feet higher, which is exactly what they're depicting against the Statue of Liberty to show us a reference point. Now, I think actually, as I said to one of you this morning before the talk, in a way that's a, uh, a message that distracts us because that's not going to happen for 500 years, maybe a couple of thousand years, melting all the ice. So there's no point in stressing ourselves and panicking over something which is not imminent. But it does allow us to think through that we are in a different era and something different than all human civilization. Sea level hasn't changed much in 5,000 years, which is pretty much the length of our human civilization. Five, six, eight thousand years, our written record, ancient religious texts, however you want to characterize it. But civilization, just for round figures, is a five or six thousand year period. The Chinese calendar, the Jewish calendar, whatever construct you want to use to define when we became civilized. But the last time sea level was higher was 120,000 years ago. And I want to give you that geologic perspective today because it's rock solid. No pun intended. And people say, well, this has happened before. Climate's a natural thing. There's a natural cycle. They're absolutely right. They just have no clue about the time periods that are involved. And it's very, it's irrefutable. I have done this talk now for two and a half years. I do it professionally. I help not only companies and communities and governments, both national security and foreign governments, try and understand what does this mean, that this is a paradigm change. This changes the baseline. This is not like flooding. Flooding is temporary. This is submergence. This is catastrophic coastline change. Something we've never contemplated. One of the best places to illustrate that happens to be the state we're in presently, Florida. I show this slide all over the world because people all recognize the shape of Florida. 20,000 years ago, during the peak of the last ice age, when a lot more ice was locked up on the continents, sea level was down 390 feet and Florida was twice the size. Because particularly the shallow banks off to the west were dry. Now if we went back to the last warm spot in the geologic cycle, and I'm going to teach you a little bit of geology today. 120,000 years ago, Florida was half the size because sea level then was 25 feet higher than now. Pretty stunning visualization, right? That's not a made up graphic and it's not a computer model. That's just determined from where we know that sea level and the shoreline was 20,000 years ago and 120,000 years ago. So what's happening with sea level rise? Well, in the 20th century, or since, in fact, shown here since 1850, a century and a half, sea level has been climbing, and it does go up and down a little bit year to year. It's really hard to measure, because in the entire scope of this graph, this picture, I'm going to show you three different time perspectives. But in this image, we're showing 160 years, and sea level has risen about seven or eight inches as a global average. I, it's interesting as to why do the blips go up and down. It has to do with weather patterns, which vary year to year, and the amount of snowfall and the amount of melting and a lot of other things. Um, looking ahead to this next slide, that same eight inch, inches of global average sea level change is depicted as the red wavy line toward the bottom. Can you see that? About a quarter of the way up the chart. Well, those 13 bars are 13 cities in the United States to show you how sea level varies from place to place. So global sea level, surprisingly, is not the same everywhere. The column on the left is outside of New Orleans, 46 inches. Then Norfolk is 30 inches, New York is 14, Miami 12, and on the far right is Los Angeles at four. So how in the same period of time since 1880 could global average sea level be about eight inches New Orleans 46, New York 14, and Los Angeles 4. And the difference is because land moves up or down slightly too. And the rate of sea level change we're talking about is something like an inch a year. 
So if the ocean goes up an inch or less a year or a decade even, and the land subsides a little bit, it's either going to add to the apparent sea level rise or reduce it. So what happens is that in New Orleans where the ground is sinking because of taking water and petroleum out of the ground, plus it's on silt flats from the, uh, the delta of the Mississippi River, the land's compacting for all those reasons. And in Los Angeles where the Pacific Plate, the tectonic plate goes underneath California, it has raised Los Angeles by about four inches. So a global sea level rise of eight inches appears to be only four in Los Angeles. That's why they get all the earthquakes out there. So this becomes a very holistic picture that you can see that suddenly lots of things which may not make sense. Well, how come it's not that much here? How come it's more here? It actually does make sense. If we step back to the last ice age, 20,000 years ago, again, we see the big picture. And three striking things come out of us from this chart. One is that, again, sea level rose 390 feet in that 20,000 year period. And it got to the present height more or less five or 6,000 years ago. Again, pretty much when we began keeping written records. And probably that accounts for why we have trouble believing it's gonna change much. And the other thing is that right in the middle there, there's a big step, two steps in fact, and that's, we call the meltwater pulse 1A, which is just a way to describe that, boy, there was a big change in sea level about 65 feet in four centuries by nature. Pretty stunning, hard to imagine that. That's a foot and a half a decade of sea level rise for 40 decades. It'd be hard to keep up with that. And that was in nature without us warming anything. We'll come back to this in a minute. The reason that this happens is what I said, referred to the ice ages. Now, how many of you remember reading about the ice ages in, in school? Okay, and maybe you saw the four part documentary series. Uh, um, this was part two, Ice Age, the meltdown. If you have kids or grandkids, you may have seen this. My daughter was six at the time this came out and I watched this 30 or 40 times behind Manny, Diego, Sid and Scat, okay? Behind the animals. I do this for two reasons. One is we've got to laugh about this a little bit. We've got to keep a sense of humor that the planet has changed and we need to realize what we can affect and what we can't affect and where we need to adapt and change our ways and where we need to try and change things. And I, that's really important perspective. And to do that, we need to keep a sense of humor. The other thing is it helps to remember the facts. Behind the animals, there's two miles of ice. Two miles of ice is roughly 10,000 feet of ice. That's about all I need to remember. 10,000 feet of ice in the northern hemisphere melted and raised the ocean level almost 400 feet. You get that science, right? You don't need a degree in geology to understand that. That's about all you need to understand to realize the relationship between ice sheets and sea level and the shoreline and real estate and investments and where we live and our cities. We took a lot for granted. We were pretty ignorant. We built cities thinking the shoreline was permanent. There's a new reality. One way to visualize this is to look at a 47 story building, which happens to be a building in Miami, but it just happens to fit the actual heights. During that peak of the last ice age, 20,000 years ago, sea level was effectively at the ground floor, street level. Then over 14,000 years, it rose to the 30th floor where we are today. When all the remaining ice melts, we'll get another 212 feet or 17 floors of sea level rise. Again, that's not gonna happen in this century or next century or the century thereafter. The earliest it could happen is probably 500 years and if we slow things down, maybe we'll get 5,000 years. But it's a new reality. And again, it's, you know, is, is it sobering? Is it scary? Is it disturbing? Is it a problem? Yeah, but so is getting older and dying. I mean, we need to face things realistically. It may disturb our vision of reality, just like a health crisis, but just like a health crisis, it should pro provoke us to think different and maybe do something different. And I'm gonna conclude this, there are two things we need to do differently. We need to begin adapting to a changing planet and we also need to try and slow the warming. And we gotta do them both, it's not one or the other. And I'll reinforce that in my book does and all of my materials.